worship team. Appreciate a worship team that just ushers in the presence of the Holy Spirit. That gets it. That understands we're not here to just sing songs. We're here to encounter the presence of God. It's different than singing songs. It's not the same. Praise the Lord. great spirit in this place today. I want to remind you uh, about Tuesday morning prayer. If you have time, come on out at 8 o'clock. I mean, I'm really enjoying this together. Uh, just praying for an hour. There's really no format. We just come in and spend time seeking the face of the Lord and we kind of come together at the end and pray. We try to end at 9, uh, although you can stay later than that. But I just want to invite you out. Uh, I'm enjoying this, and I've talked to Mr. Broly. I don't believe it will conflict with the school. I'd love to keep this, just keep it going and not let it be just in the summer. So come on out at 8 o'clock. Guys, I really feel like that the, the Lord uh, is moving this church into a difficult season. And it's not a bad season. It's a difficult season. It's a good season, actually. Um, and I just want to encourage you, before I get to the sermon this morning, don't get disheartened. I feel like there's people that might not want to make this journey. You know, Jesus also had the same. You remember when times got tough, when he started bringing some heavy truths, people left. I mean, you remember when he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have any part in me. And that was tough. That's tough words to hear. And uh, the disciples came to him because a lot of people left. And they said, Jesus, that, that kind of offended people. You need to back up from that. And Jesus said, you're welcome to leave too. And he said, uh, obviously in love, he, he's not going to compromise truth. And the season I feel like God's moving us into is a season of intentional, heavy discipleship. And drawing closer, we... We've been bringing some heaviness, some, some of the heavy truths of the Word of God. And I believe that God has got something else for us today. John, when he came, he had one message. And man, people, they just flocked to him out in the wilderness. And that message was, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You know, we kind of live in a culture where we all want a salvation without repentance. And it doesn't work like that, church. It, it doesn't work like that at all. You know, we all want a Savior without having a Lord. We all want salvation without repentance. And all along, the word that has never left is repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Repent and be baptized. Repent. And you cannot have the gospel without repentance. It just doesn't happen. And we kind of live in a place we like to toy with things. We like to be in close proximity to things that we know we shouldn't have any part in. And the word of the Lord never has changed. You know, that's the thing about God. He, he has his mind pretty well made up on how things should be. Repent. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. We're going to learn about what true repentance looks like. By looking at something that the children of Israel did. And they failed in this over and over and over again. Even though multiple times they kind of went back to the Lord. They still had this main thing that they just couldn't eradicate out of their life. And what I'm going to talk about today is this goddess Asherah. When they came into the promised land. There was a foreign god named Asherah. And if you read through the Old Testament, you'll see this phrase, the Asherah pole. They would erect on the high places. They would offer incense and burn offerings to the goddess Asherah. And you read over and over and over about it. But I want to just pick out a few passages this morning for us to highlight before we see what true repentance looks like. As they were coming up out of Egypt, they had crossed the Red Sea and were at the end of Exodus. And in verse 11... The Lord tells them, observe what I command you this day, because I'm going to drive out the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, and the Jebusites. 
Those always go better if you say them fast. Take heed to thyself. Unless you make a covenant with the people of the land where you're going, for it will be a snare in the midst of you. You shall destroy their altars, break their image, and cut down their Asherah poles. Asherah was a goddess of fertility. For thou shalt worship no other god for the Lord but the Lord, whose name is Jealous. He's a jealous God. So as they're coming up, God sets the law. He says, you're not to even toy with this. As you go in, I'm going to deliver you. Cut down these altars. They're going to become a snare to you if not. Cut down the Asherah poles. This has nothing to do with what I have for you. So God makes it clear that you're to have nothing to do with this. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 5, he reinforces that. He says, this is how you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their Asherah poles. Say, cut down the Asherah. In Judges chapter 3, verse 5, it says that the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. It's interesting that here we are, chapters and books later in the Bible, after God said, you're not to do this. Get rid of these people. I'm going to drive them out. And here we are as they're in the promised land, in Judges. And it says, first of all, that they dwelt among them. Why are they dwelling among something that God says, I don't want you to have part in that. That's not for you. That's not what I want you to be a part of. Drive them out. And they go in. And they dwell among them. And verse 6 says, They took their daughters for their wives. They gave their daughters to their sons. They served their gods. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And they forgot the Lord their God. And they served Baal and Asherah. Boy, that's a stark difference, isn't it? From God specifically saying, Cut these things down. Drive them out. And here they are in the book of Judges as they're in the promised land. They're not only dwelling amongst them, they're intermarrying with them. And they forsook or they forgot the Lord their God. And they started worshiping Baal and Asherah. Wow. Boy, sin moves quick, doesn't it? I mean, I've seen it in my life as I'm sure you've seen it in yours. The things, and I preached on this a couple months ago, this topic of what you tolerate today will dominate you tomorrow. And it's still true. Here they are now in the promised land. And what God said, no, here they are. They're intermarrying amongst them and now they're worshiping them. In 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 15, it says, For the Lord will smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water. He shall root out Israel out of this good land which he gave to their fathers. And he'll scatter them beyond the river because they have made their Asherah, provoking the Lord to anger. That's one step further. Because at first when we started this, it was these foreign entities God. Asherah was their God. And God said, drive them out, cut them down. And they go, they intermarry, they dwell there. Now they forsook the Lord. And now it's interesting that God is referring to this as Asherah, their God. Because now they've taken ownership of something that they were forbidden to have a part in in the beginning. And in 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 5, it says this, And the Lord gave Israel a Savior. So that they went out from under the hand of the Syrians and the children of Israel, they went back to their own tents as before. Praise God. Nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who made Israel sin, but walked therein and remained following the Asherah pole. Now, wow. God delivers them. Now, I, I just want you to draw a picture of this because I think this is how a lot of us think. I've been caught in this trap a lot. We get a lot of our identity from our proximity to the Lord. You know, we're here in church this morning and we feel pretty good about that. We are asking God to forgive us. But oftentimes we want God to have part of our hearts and we don't want Him to have quite everything. We still toy with little corners of our heart that we think God excuses because He has most of it. 
Let me tell you, we don't serve a God that wants most of you. We serve a God that wants all of us. And when we tolerate things that he says no, it's going to become a snare to us over and over and over again. And here they are in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 6. And I'm almost done with the passages, so don't let me lose you in all this reading. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria, they took Samaria and carried Israel away into Syria, uh, Assyria. And they placed them in Halah and in Habor by the river Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt and under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. They walked in the statutes of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel and the kings of Israel, which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. And they built up the high places in all their cities from the tower of the watchmen to the fifth city. And they set up images and Asherah in every high hill and every green tree. And there they burned incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them. And it brought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. I just chose a few passages here this morning to show you the picture of how this happened. God said no, okay? He said don't have one part of this. They dwell, they intermarry, and now here they are. It's their God, and it's constantly a snare. And I've been reading through the Chronological Bible this year, which is a really interesting way to read, but I'm kind of stuck in the kings right now. And you're just reading king after king after king. This king did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. This king did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He followed the ways of his father David, and it's just over and over and over. Some are good, some are bad. But there's one thing that stuck out to me, which is where this is coming from today. Over and over and over, you see this phrase. This king did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He followed the Lord as did his father David. But he did not remove the high places or cut down the Asherah poles. Now that's interesting to me. How can we say that we're God followers, but at the same time, we have these little things that we're tolerating in our lives. And it keeps pulling us back in to the life that we're trying to get away from. Has anybody ever been a victim of that before? You know, you really want there, but you, you're trying to follow the Lord, but it's this one thing you just won't cut ties with. That's what Asherah represented to Israel. I'm telling you guys, in this life, oftentimes it's relationships. A lot of times it's friends, man. And I'm telling you, I'm not saying be rude to people, but... When there comes a time that people are pulling us away from the Lord, there has to be a time of separation where we cut ties with people that are pulling us back from following Jesus. Man, isn't that difficult? Because oftentimes it's family members. Oftentimes it's people we grew up with. But if they're pulling us away from the Lord, it's not worth it. And that's how it was with Asherah. Man, it was so difficult to see this process. And I know God's heart had to be grieving because he would see them come back to him and worship him. We have no God but you. We're not going to cut that down. But God, we're going to restore the worship in the temple. We're going to serve you. We're going to send sacrifices to you. But we're going to leave that up there. We'll just leave that alone. That does not work. <laughs> it doesn't work following Jesus. Man, it's difficult. Are you in a place that you desire freedom? Who's here this morning that you could say, I want freedom in my life in some areas? Good, we got four people. Either the rest of us are free or our arms are broke. It's a joke. I want to tell you something. There's not a measure too far <coughs> that we could take. Here, a couple months ago, we had a mouse in our house. That foul, devilish, demonic creature made its way into our domain. Let me tell you what happens when we get the random mouse in our house. And my wife thinks this might be a little extreme. One mouse, I go to Walmart, and I buy about 25 to 30 traps. <laughs> 
This is not an embellishment for a sermon. I promise you, this is the truth. I go through every nook and cranny of that house in strategic locations. And it's a mixture because I don't care what it takes. Some of them are those that they go in and it clips and they're stuck and you're supposed to humanely dispose of them. Some people take them and they relocate them. I tell you, I, I'm sorry. If they get in my house, they're going to be relocated, but it's into the arms of the Father. That's, that's where we're going to relocate them to. We're not going to relocate them back into their natural habitat. Some of them are glue traps. I know they're inhumane. I don't care. Some of them are the snap wooden traps. Imagine one little scared mouse. 30 traps all over this house. You have to be careful when you get up in the morning and go into your coffee or you're going to have a, a dangerous situation. But let me tell you what happens the next morning. Always. We have either a dead mouse or a struggling mouse. We've caught it. And you might think, Richie, that's extreme. 30 traps. You had to, that cost money, first of all. Let me tell you something. I'm devoted to getting that mouse out of my house. And I don't care what it costs. I don't care what it takes. It's gone. I'm out. You're out of here. Okay, let's be honest. Is anybody else, you're that extreme. Is there any other, thank you. There's other people that, I drew a line and it's, you shall not pass this line, mouse. It's not going to happen. I want to catch the mouse and I want it out. And I don't care what measures it takes me to get it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me tell you, learn something from that. Amen. That's exactly how we have to be with things that are snaring us and Amen. pulling us back in. A lot of times we might just take one trap and set it out. That's not going to work. You have to go all in to get it out. Over and over and over, they tolerated something that God said no. They're intermarrying with the people, and now Asherah is their God. They're worshiping Asherah themselves. How did that happen? Because something got in the house, and they did not draw that type of line and said, you can't be here. Amen. Desperate times call for desperate measures. I don't want things in my life that God says, no. You can't have that there. Let me tell you something about repentance too. Repentance is not from that way to this way. Repentance is the decision that we make. It's actions that we do. Forgiveness comes from God to us. Repentance goes from us to God. It's a willful decision that this is out of here. I don't want this in my life anymore. I'm done with this mindset. I'm done with this sin. It's out. Whatever it takes to get it out, it's gone. But we live in this culture, once again, just like Israel, that tolerates these things. And it's like breeding grounds for this type of lifestyle. But praise God, there was a king that got it right. And how beautiful it was in the prayer meeting on Tuesday. God spoke this to me, and I thought, man, everybody needs to hear this. <laughs> After all these years of being bound, all these years of coming back, all these years of trying to get it right, of trying to serve the Lord, but tolerating the high places, open your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 34. I want to look at a king <laughs> that when the mouse got in his house, he went to buy him some traps. Remember, God said no. They dwelt there. They intermarried. Now it's their God that keeps them in a snare. Everybody still following me this morning? <laughs> this king's name was Josiah. He didn't want to just be in close proximity to God. He wanted God to have it all. Now listen to how old this kid was. 
Josiah was eight years old. Do we have any eight-year-olds in here this morning? It's not the kids. Is anybody eight? Come on, somebody be brave. There's no eight. They're in children's church. Eight years old. When he became king and began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. There's the phrase. And he walked in the ways of David his father. There's that phrase. He did not turn aside to the right or the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, what's eight? What's eight? I know it's summer. We've got to refresh our minds. Who's 16? Come on up, bud. I need a, I need a visual. Uh, it's here. I need, there's another. When he was 16 years old. What's your name, bud? Joshua. Thank you. You're not that scary, trust me. 16 years old. I got a 16-year-old young man right here. He's following the ways of the Lord. When he was 16 he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places. Six plus six plus four. Twenty? No, eight plus eight plus four. Gosh. I need a twenty-year-old. Grace Tarnowski is twenty years old. Up, up. All right, stand right here. Proud of this one. Okay, so he's eight years old. He becomes king. That would be interesting. When he's 16, he starts to uh, get a hunger to serve the Lord and starts to pursue God. And when he's 20, he begins to purge Israel. Let me tell you something. Some of us need to go through our houses and start purging some things. All right, here we go. 20 years old, he begins to purge Israel and Judah of the high places. The Asherah and the carved and metal images. I was going to bring an axe, but I was afraid our officer out front wouldn't like that. So I've decided not to do that. But imagine I'm holding an axe. We're going to have to play to 10 this morning. <laughs> There's a mouse in the house. He chopped down the altars of the Baals in his presence. 20 years old. He's already been serving and seeking the Lord for four years. He's been serving God or had been king for 12 years. And now he takes an axe at 20 years old and he goes down and chops the altars down of the bales in his presence. And he cut down the incense altars that stood above them. Imagine watching this 20-year-old young person. I don't say the phrase kid anymore. but Imagine this 20-year-old man out there who's king with an axe in his hand and says, This is gone. And starts chopping it down in front of everybody. Now he didn't do this in secret. He did this right there in the open. And after he chopped down the Asherah. He broke it in pieces. And he broke the carved and metal images. And he made dust of them. Wow. Okay, it's not just enough to chop them down. It's like, okay, that's done. He's like doing this in anger. Like, I'm tired of this being a snare in my life. You're out. And he takes this axe. He's chopping it down. And then in front of everybody, he grinds it into powder. How long that took, I have absolutely no idea. But I can tell you, they didn't have the modern tools that we have. And he drops and cuts this thing down to a fine powder. Doesn't that seem a little extreme? I mean, it's a, could he just like say, chop these things down or have somebody else do it? Doesn't that seem a little much? 
I mean, come on. But the truth is, when Israel had been tolerating this in their lives for so long and it had been a snare over and over and over and over and over, somebody stepped up and said, we're done with this. It's like Tom was saying earlier. They're, we're done with this. Something's got to change. And he's out there with this axe and he's chopping and he's grinding. But he's not done setting his, quote, mouse traps yet. Because it's not caught. <laughs> He's got this powder now of a old Asherah pole. And he takes the dust of the Asherah pole and he scatters it over the graves of those that had sacrificed to them. And imagine this 20-year-old young person with the powder now. He's just going around graves and just spreading powder all over the place. Other people had to be thinking... What in the world is wrong with this kid? This is our king? What is that powder? What in the world is he doing? He wasn't done yet. Scatters it over the graves. Are you still with me? Verse 5. He also burned the bones of the priest that had sacrificed to them and he cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. This guy, whatever they did with bones, if it was in a cave or if they buried him, he's still ticked off. He's chopping it down, getting it down, driving it into small pieces, getting it into powder. He's going to the graves of people that had sacrificed to him, just throwing powder all over the place. He digs the bones up, and he just decides, hey, let's have a bone fire here, and he sets all the bones on fire. I mean, seriously, maybe God at this point, I get it, you don't like this. He was so devoted to getting it out. Let me tell you something. That's what true repentance looks like in our life. See, a lot of times we come to, oh, God, forgive me, I'm messed up, you know. Oh, oh Lord, I'm such a mess. Oh, God, please, please, Jesus, help me, help me not to do this. But truthfully, in our hearts, we're not willing to go to any extent to get it out. And so we remain bound. I told you it's going to get heavy. Let me tell you, freedom is there for those who want it. Freedom is there for God's children because it's a promise of God. He said, for those he said free, they are free indeed. If this indeed freedom is out there, then why are so many of God's people bound? It's because we refuse to go to the desperate measures to get done with that. Where's my Bible? To get done with that job. Cuts them down, grinds them up, spreads them over the bones, digs the bones up, sets the bones on fire, and he purged Judah and Jerusalem. And you guys can sit down. Thank you, 20-year-old and 16-year-old. In the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon and as far as Naphtali and their ruins all around, he broke down the altars and beat the Asherah and the images and the powder and he cut down all the incense altars throughout. All of the land. And he returned to Jerusalem. God is desiring a true repentance in his people. The book of Joel tells us, don't rend your garments. That's phony. Rend your hearts. That's what I want. I want you to rend your hearts. I want it all. I don't want some phony repentance. Get serious about it. Let's get it out. And here Josiah comes along. And man, he is sick and tired of being bound. I hate this thing and I want it out. Am I talking to the rock crowd this morning? Do we want to do what's right and still tolerate it? Because the truth is, freedom is called. What does that practically look like? 
must practically look like in today's society. <coughs> it depends on what the sin is. You know, don't ask the Lord forgiveness of alcoholism and then leave booze in your cupboard. You're <coughs> messing up with pain pills and you're addicted. Don't say, God, help me overcome it. Go home and flush them down the toilet. You messing around with somebody that's not your spouse, lose their number. Move. Don't talk to them. Oh, God, I can do it. I'm strong enough. No, you're not. You're going to keep falling into the same trap over and 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 over, and over, and over just like Israel did. See, the truth is there's freedom for those who want it. But it's going to take true repentance. <laughs> It's going to take going out there in the sight of everybody and chopping it down. I was talking to Derek the other day about this word that the Lord had spoken to me. And he said, man, I remember we went on a prayer walk one time out in Hawaii. And there was a kid, he was just so sick and tired of addict, being addicted to pornography. We're just out there praying. And he said the kid took his phone and took a rock and beat his phone into pieces. He said, I'm done with this. That's a little extreme. That's expensive. What if it meant freedom? It's a price that we need to pay. See, when we get down to the place where we're willing to pay any price to be free, freedom will come. Because when we search for him with all our heart, that's where we find him. I don't know. Maybe I'm talking to the wrong people. Because I believe that's where we live today. We want to be in proximity to the Lord, but truthfully, we don't want to do that. People might see. They saw Josiah. What in the world is he doing out there? That's weird. You're the king. I don't care. This is gone. We're done with this. Chop, chop, chop. Grind, grind, grind. Burn, burn, burn. <laughs> We live in times of desperation, guys. And the question remains, do you want to be free? Do you want to be free? I don't know what it is that has you found, but do you want to be free? How do we get to that place? Just like we started. There is no gospel without repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe. Repent and be baptized. Repent and times of refreshing will come in the presence of the Lord. Repent. Repentance is going this way, that way. God, I understand it takes the strength of the Holy Spirit to walk it out. But it is a willful decision of I'm done with this lifestyle. Repent. Repent. Whew, man, what a beautiful word from the Lord. Repent. God will restore. He will heal. He will enable. I feel burning in my spirit. And nobody may be willing to do this. But I feel like it's time for some desperate measures in this place this morning. I don't know what it is. Maybe an act of desperation is running to the altar. Maybe like the guy Derek, maybe you need to take your phone on the parking lot and explode it. Mom. Maybe you need to go home and take the computer and the TV out the yard and pour gas on it. Yeah. And be careful. If we want freedom, it's there for us. If we want to play church games, God will let us do that too. But we won't ever be free. We'll keep looking up at that high place in our lives that's trying to control us and telling us, you can't be free of me. It takes desperate measures for somebody to climb the high spot and chop it down in front of everybody for the world to see. But man, Josiah left that place free.
And the Bible says he purged that sin from Israel and Judah. They were purged. What does that mean? It isn't there anymore. They had intermarried. They had dwelt among them. That was their God. God referred to him as their God. And one guy said, I'm repenting of this. It's done. I don't care what it looks like. Don't care who knows. Freedom is coming to Israel. Does anybody want to be free? Thank you, Jesus. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is hand. It's at hand. I'm tired of being bound. Tired of being controlled. Tired of that telling me what I can be and can't have. Because God says, He who the Son sets free is free indeed. But to get to free indeed, we got to get some things out. We've tolerated stuff, and it's time for it to go. It's time for it to go. What about It surely it is. Absolutely. Absolutely it's part of it. A life of no compromise. Exactly right. Exactly right. Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, there's desperate acts that need to take place in this place this morning. And I don't know what you're going to do right now. But we're going to wait on you because you want freedom to reign in the house of God. Be ready, guys. Don't play anything yet. Father, in Jesus' name, it's up to us. Lord, obviously, you're the freedom giver, the bondage breaker, Lord. But it comes at the price of repentance. And you're asking us this morning, will you go to desperate measures to catch the mouse and to get it out? Lord, this is our domain. This is your land. Lord, this is your church. Lord, we've dwelt among, we've married with it, Father. We've tolerated things for far enough, Lord. Lord, it's time for us to be known as your people again. Maybe it's sins of the heart. Maybe it's attitudes. Maybe it's things that you wish other people didn't even have to know. Whatever it is, we want it gone. We want our Asherah out. We want it out, Lord. 